Chapter 9, 7th grade. Mean kids and bullying. Do you ever feel like you married the 7th grade bully? It's no secret that we marry our opposites in one way or another, and these differing traits can be the very things that keep our relationships exciting, interesting, and great classrooms of learning. Somewhere along the way, usually shortly after the betrothal phase has ended and marriage begins, the very things that attracted us to each other become the same things we can't seem to stand about each other. My husband was attracted to my innocence, which turned into disgust over what post-marriage he perceived as ignorance and immaturity. I was attracted to his loyalty and helpfulness, which after marriage I perceived as an unhealthy attachment to his family and a desire to please everyone. After you allow your perception of what once made you fall in love to something that you view with disapproval and disdain, you become mean and condescending. No one wants to be married to a parental control. But once we decide we know better than the other person, we turn into the classroom bully and create a very hostile environment. Not contributing to a healthy learning environment, correcting our spouses every move and every word as we look over them like a parent over a child trying to guide and correct them at every turn. It's only a short amount of time after a spouse places themselves in a parental role in their marriage that the confidence of the bullied spouse starts to decline until they both resent each other and no longer have the same attraction to each other they had once treasured. Being kind to each other, regardless of how you feel, is the quality of a matured and pleasant marriage. I endured a long battle of convincing my husband that words, tone, energy, attitude, and body language are all factors in the type of classroom you design for your relationship. If you are feeling bullied, the best way to handle a bully is to stop giving them the reactions and responses that fuel their addiction for conflict. When a bully is ignored, they often find themselves having to deal with themselves, many times literally finding themselves in contention with themselves because the victim is no longer available. A bully needs an injured party in order to continue harassment. Like a parasite to a host, if the host isn't available, the parasitic nature will have to work itself out in other ways besides being the blood-sucking burden in the life of their spouse. No victim, no bully. No matter how tired or wounded you feel, the victim energy you radiate only attracts more bully behavior. Work on changing your victim feelings into warrior feelings. I am tired of being treated like that, but I will learn how to get my point across effectively and I will not take my spouse's need for more training personally. Remember that what you allow will continue. Being married happily is all about teaching each other how you want to be treated. Waiting for your student to learn your lessons well enough to be able to apply them takes patience and time. All teachers have to prepare lesson plans. Creative, well thought out lesson plans make the best experiences for students and teachers alike and significantly increase a student's ability to retain information. When emotion is combined with an experience, those experiences are stored as long term memories, be they positive or negative. Men often joke about how women remember and hold on to things over an extended period of time. A key to helping your wife heal is to learn how she wants to be treated so she can release the record of your wrongdoings that she holds on to in order to remind you of how many times she has had to endure certain behaviors that cause her pain and discomfort. Defensively, we, men and women, tend to hold on to things we think will help teach our spouse to change so we can stop experiencing the same pain over and over again. The line between remembering where your spouse continues to mess up in order to remind them of your need for them to change 
versus holding on to the negative feelings their mess ups cause you is a very thin and emotionally treacherous border. A teacher logs a student's grades along with notes on their performance, behavior, attitude, and other areas of learning. But if at parent-teacher conferences, the teacher is crying and ready to change careers as she goes over the report card with the parents, she is internalizing the shortcomings of her student as her own personal failure, counterproductively feeding negative feelings when what she needs to do is disassociate her feelings and professionally assess the student's needs. Moving forward with confidence and a passion to be even more resourceful, creative, and inspiring. The defeated teacher looking for a new career is the spouse who has decided that life will be better after divorce. Before they have given their all toward being the best teacher and best student of marriage they could possibly be. The student with learning disabilities is not the shortfall of the classroom, but rather the teacher who doesn't learn to adapt to the needs of the student and the lesson that the experience aims to teach. Many times, the school bully is also the student with learning or social disabilities. Set boundaries and be patient and creative in finding new and different ways to teach the lessons your student needs to learn. Withholding affection and sex to teach your spouse a lesson is a short-lived resolution, like a Band-Aid for a gunshot wound. For many years, my strategy for dealing with bullying was to retaliate and withdraw. Vengeance added to the negative force that ruled our classroom of matrimony and delayed us from reaching our aspirations. S E. X, synchronized ecstasy in Xanadu. What are the secrets of lasting desire in long-term relationships? A key to enjoying and keeping your attraction to your mate is being in sync with each other, being present with each other on the same page. Despite the knowledge that many women struggle to keep up with the more frequent sexual meetings their husbands crave, I have seen the opposite challenge occur as well. The wife wants more intimacy and the husband is evading or simply just desires less intimacy than her. Hopefully, I have gotten the point across that I don't subscribe to the idea that all behaviors are gender specific. An amazing revelation my husband and I have come to realize is that creative personality types are, on a frequent basis, experiencing a hormonal dump of stimuli that are released into the body, similar to the experience sex provides when the creative wheels of right brainers spin. My husband was reluctant to share with me many years ago that he could see in me a detached and personal self-fulfilling experience similar to yet completely opposite of SEX gratification. Every time I would get excited about my visionary thoughts and the realization that limitless possibilities abound for our lives. His perspective was that my struggle to meet him at his level of desire was that I had frequently satisfied myself through what I call self-ecstasy over my own ideas, fantasizing about the future through my natural creative mental dispensation. If you focus on fixing the issues mentioned in this book, sex and its complications involving all of the variable context of life that make it such a hot button issue within our marriage will be much easier to resolve. When both of you feel love, respect, trust, appreciation, effective communication, and the resulting joy, synchronized ecstasy in Xanadu returns to its original healthy position within the marriage in spite of childbirth, parenting, post-traumatic stress, work, household chores, and the rest of life that we allow to interrupt our desired flow. How excited can you get yourself? The secret to long-lasting desire is the realization that you get yourself excited and in tune with your partner. If you wait for your partner to turn on the passion switch, you may be waiting for an eternity. 
Sex is nothing more than a mental switch that you have the power to turn on and off. It is a place you go to more than an act you perform. It's a place you go to more so than an act you perform. And this is the rationale that inspired me to coin the acronym for sex as synchronized ecstasy in Xanadu. Synchronization has to do with timing and alignment. Being in tune with each other comes naturally in the beginning of a relationship when passion takes little effort to ignite and becomes more difficult when a person allows mental blocks from emotions to rule their mind, body, and heart. Ecstasy is, according to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, a state of being beyond reason and self-control, a state of overwhelming emotion, especially rapturous delight, end quote. Hmm. Rapturous delight. How often are you and your spouse raptured away to Xanadu? Xanadu is another word for Eden, an idyllic, exotic, or lavish place. Sex. It's all in your head. Are you turned on or are you turned off? You choose. If you place the responsibility of making you happy in the hands of another, you are out of control and bound to be waiting to experience Xanadu until after death. Don't wait to experience good, better, and the best until you have been raptured away from the earth. Rapture can occur anytime you decide to elevate yourself beyond the normal standard of what you have been experiencing on earth. It's not about competing with others or keeping up with the Joneses, but it's definitely about outdoing yourself and always striving to be and create a better life experience. Being your best self, you tap into the infinite creativity which floats around your universe. At your best, you discover the frequency that connects you to the version of you that you were created to be. Being able to selflessly focus on your spouse and others, building for future generations, is an ability that comes from a full and overflowing lifestyle, otherwise referred to as a cup many times in the scriptures. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Psalm 23 verse 5. Empty cups. Masturbation and pornography are undoubtedly controversial topics among believers and non-believers alike. The question of the effect these activities cause have long been important topics of discussion in marriage and family counseling circles. The debate over whether masturbation and pornography are natural and normal or destructive and dysfunctional are ever-present undercurrents that are too often avoided at the counseling table. How does involvement in these activities affect the health of our relationships? Let's talk about it. The health of our intimate relationships is a direct reflection of the health of the relationship we have with ourself. In an individualistic society, it is no shock that pornography and self-gratification has morphed from unmentionable and forbidden to not only acceptable, but even encouraged. Encouraged to couples as a way to keep their love life exciting and encouraged to our young boys as a way to manage impulse and moderate otherwise sexually active teens. The most convincing of lies are accepted as truth by the masses and our relationships and the health of our children's future marriages suffer. It's no secret that a large number of the parents of teenagers agonizingly tolerate young men and women with anger issues and exaggerated emotional instability. Hormonal changes and the accepted status quo of adolescence has brought forth an ideal that normalizes the affliction that comes to teens and their parents alike as they struggle to maintain normalcy in their relationship with everyone in their life. 
It is hard to maintain balance and function when dysfunction is the accepted norm and function is looked down upon as being religious, rigid, or too strict. Parents who have yet to be empowered by the knowledge that can eliminate so much of the ails we face in dealing with and raising children and teens could benefit much by the techniques and principles that have been deeply hidden by our acceptance of what society and media has portrayed as normal teenage behavior and normal parenting. Our expectations as young people and as older adults have been largely shaped by contemporary philosophies as to what attributes contribute to the development of functional and well-rounded adults. Although parenting could never be altogether explained in a few paragraphs, there are revolutionary essentials that can springboard your understanding on where many of us have gone wide off the mark with our children and how these essentials can reduce headache and heartache in the relationship we create with them and the relationships they, in turn, create in their adulthood. As parents, we have the opportunity to teach our children what an ideal marriage looks like and how to assess wise relationships from foolish ones. It's never too late to acknowledge where we may have fallen short. None of us is perfect, but apologizing to our adult children for our known and unknown shortfalls can begin a chain of needed healing and improvement in the relationships they find themselves in. Because married couples often argue over issues regarding how to raise the children, I'm providing a short list of the very many possible paradigm shifts we can start to consider. Babies cannot be spoiled by being attended to every time they cry. Babies' cries are a language to communicate a variety of needs from hunger to a needed diaper change to a need to be held and interacted with a need for love. If I had a dollar for every time I have heard a person say that if a baby is held too much, they will become habitually inclined to depend on attention, I would own the bank. Toddlers and children are a different story. If a child learns that they can cry or have a tantrum and get away with what they want, the parents need to reassess their plan of action with regard to the responses given to this child when the child acts out. The parent should train the child, not the child training the parent to give them what they want when they act out. Rewarding wrong behavior sends the wrong message and ensures more and intensified trouble down the road. You can spoil your children and teens by giving excessively and satisfying materialistic desires when that said child's wants are not earned and not truly appreciated. This child is subconsciously programmed to delay transitioning into adulthood, responsibility, and independence, most likely still living with their parents and in fear of progressing into adulthood in the later stages. Spoiling a person has nothing to do with socioeconomic status. A person from a poor household can be just as spoiled as a person from a six or seven figure income family. People learn strong work ethic and motivation in their childhood. If you pay your kids an allowance without requiring work beyond regular life skills and regular life chores like dishes and laundry, they may have an unrealistic expectation as to what it takes to become an income earner. Likewise, if you pay out an allowance without requiring any work at all, you are more likely to create a false sense of entitlement. A great lesson for teaching humility and gratitude is to have your child gift someone less fortunate than them with something of value to them that they currently own yet have shown unappreciation for either through disrespect for the parents or others, or for any misbehavior you want to address and correct. Have them give something away as a consequence. Read Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, to understand who your child is and what plan of action you can take to encourage them on the correct career path for their unique personality and gifting.
Rich dad, poor dad affirmed deep-seated thoughts and concerns my husband and I had toiled over for years and made decision-making in our parenting that much easier. Keep them busy. Idle minds and hands have plenty room for vain imagination and mischief. A demanding schedule for your child or teen leaves little time for nonsense. Don't normalize masturbation, fostering an environment for young adults who in their near future will be plagued by intimacy disorders, struggling to establish and maintain healthy relationships for as long as they toil with a need to selfishly gratify themselves. They will struggle with emotional imbalance and lack of self-control. Repetitive dopamine hormone dumps breeds dopamine dope heads. Anger issues abound in men and young men alike who have become addicted to this activity and marriages suffer because of it. Parents set their young ones up to repeat the same failures of their generation by condoning masturbation and pornographic media as a normal and acceptable outlet. It's not. Although involvement in sports can teach valuable lessons and create lifelong relationships, assess your child and the impact that competition has on them personally. Assess their thoughts of where sports may take them in their future and consider the phasing out of organized sports from their regular schedule. So many young adults have expectations of becoming a professional athlete and when most don't achieve this dream, are left with damaged egos and a hindrance from moving forward. Do not allow your teenager to quote unquote date. Having significant others beyond platonic relationships complicates your child's ability to perceive people accurately in their future relationships, distorting their judgment and distracting them from focusing on developing themselves toward becoming the person they want to be for themselves and their future marriage. The exception to this rule is an intentional betrothal for people who are financially, mentally, and spiritually ready to move to the planning for and entering into the next step of marriage. If you value the principle of staying pure for marriage, you should not send your young adults to live in a college environment. For many, the college experience is a new world of bombarding philosophy opposite of biblical values and the promotion of trampling over boundaries. Moral degradation and experimentation with volatile theologies can change your child's life trajectory from a pure, encouraged, and optimistic direction into a lost and impurely influenced wanderer. Do not pay for college for a person who does not know what they want to do with their life. Knowing in this context means that a person has interned, worked in some capacity, and been consistently exposed to and has shown proficiency and gifting in a particular profession. A person that starts working at a young age and learns to balance income earning with attending school is more likely to work hard enough to discover their passion and graduate from a higher education with the degree they will use and benefit from for years to come. If going to college is even a necessary step for said individual. Learning a trade is a wise investment. Skilled tradesmen and women are always in demand. By the works of his hands, a man is blessed when we were with you. We gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. 2 Thessalonians 3 10 through 12. If you can't delineate between being your child's friend and being their parent, then be their parent. A parent who provided reasonable boundaries, 
showed love through quality time, and placed caring thought into teaching lessons and having consequences for actions will create a great friend of the adult to whom they did a great service in their upbringing. Do not neglect to encourage and push your young adults into maturity and progress out of fear that you will push them away. Better to push them into victory than to neglect them into disappointment and regret. Testing and qualifying. Break free from popular opinion regarding test time and its related anxiety and fear of failure. Willingly welcome the test that will inevitably be presented to you through your marriage and life in general. Life tests us in an innumerable and a progressively creative number of ways, empowering awareness that tests come as a requirement for progress in the form of unexpected pop quizzes and long anticipated final exams, equips students with an eagerness to prove their proficiency in various subjects. When you can foresee a test, you can also prepare yourself to give the right responses to answer the test questions presented in the form of potential arguments and negative emotional experiences with your spouse with proper, warm-hearted, and non-argumentative replies. What levels of life are you looking forward to attain? The barriers we face are necessary tests to prove we qualify for the levels we are working to attain. Some marriages may never face the same test that others may have to work through simply because they have skipped the grade that would have presented such a test, or they are working on completely different goals and have different personal challenges to conquer. We skip grades when we have enough understanding to apply what we know in real life situations, not just knowing what to say or what to write on paper. Our thoughts and actions determine what tests we may get to skip and what tests we may have to repeat several times over. Millionaires are so because they have been tested and qualified to earn and remain in such status. Just as a person can earn a status, they can lose it. Maintaining wealth, just like maintaining a wealthy marriage, is earned through hard work and the taking, failing, and retesting of one exam after another. The poor in spirit, those who continually think negative thoughts, do not attain wealth in their relationships, finances, spirituality, or physical and mental health. What are you doing to qualify for a rewarding and fulfilling marriage? What time, thought, and energy are you investing into making your life an experience that you can be proud of when you look back at the end of your days? Choosing an extramarital affair now out of frustration and desperation to have your needs met will result in lack and emotional poverty later. Choosing to abandon opportunities to work on your individual and relationship issues now will rob you of the ability to enjoy your life to its fullest down the road. Test and qualify by studying and working at perfecting every weakness that is brought to your attention. Don't ignore your weaknesses. Acknowledge them, confront them, and go to war with them to bring them into full submission. Our habits determine our future, so work diligently on forming the habits necessary to materialize the future that you desire. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Philippians 3, 12 through 15. Puberty, the seven-year itch. Finding and knowing yourself within your marriage is a journey to say the least. 
Seventh graders are no longer the novices at middle school life, but they aren't yet pros at the organization, balance of responsibilities, and time management skills needed for high school. Seventh graders still have another school year of testing and qualifying in order to prove themselves worthy for high school and the experience and privilege it has to offer. For most people I have known, seventh grade was and remains to be one of the most difficult stages of a young person's life. The very middle of middle school finds preteens in a very perplexing time of transition, hormonally and socially. Likewise, the seventh year of marriage stands as a general marker for a time of perplexing testing through an exuberant onslaught of counterintuitive feelings, emotions, and thoughts toward oneself, hormonal issues, and the marriage, social issues. Pain always has a purpose. Growing pains are a necessary anguish to highlight our needed areas for improvement and self-discovery. Boredom from the familiarity we have grown into with our marriage is not the end all for the excitement, freshness, and wonderment we once knew. You may not be the same person you were when you first got married, and that is a great thing as long as the changes you are making are progressive in nature for the betterment of yourself and the unit of your marriage. So many people get discouraged when their husband or wife becomes a different person along the marriage path. Positive change and growth should be encouraged and celebrated. Without forward movement and constant adjustments, we remain stagnant and missing opportunity because we are avoiding change. As a seventh grader in marriage, challenge yourself to set new goals rewards, and hobbies for yourself and your marriage together with your partner. Renew your vows. A ceremony and audience are not required for you to recommit and rededicate yourselves to each other, although such a milestone with your loved ones is definitely a moment of life achievement worth celebrating and capturing with others if you both so choose. Because marriage often brings two people to become interdependent, a common challenge we face is losing motivation and allowing one person to carry the load out of convenience and a comfort zone that acts as a life-sucking vortex. If you were by yourself, single and goal-oriented, how hard would you be working to achieve your goals and stay afloat? We tend to expel less energy when the person we are attracted to runs at full speed to keep the lights on and food on the table. But what would happen if both partners ran at full speed to set and accomplish goals, performing at their best ability and highest potential? Many times, the lower income earner or stay-at-home spouse will lose their drive to grow themselves and stay persistent and consistent with bringing forth their fullest potential because they feel less significant than the one making the money. The tendency to fall into the background and downplay your importance in the relationship simply because you aren't producing income is a flaw of human nature that frustrates and slows down growth for so many marriages. Once motivated and talented people shrink back and counterproductively lessen their effectiveness and impact on the world because they neglect to strive to be the best half of a power team, hiding in the shadow of a person they view as good enough for the both of them. An unnecessary pressure is placed on the spouse who knows they married a go-getter who is waiting to get going. Trading trauma and tragedy for change. Another shortcoming of our fallen nature is to wait for traumatic events and tragedy to occur in order for us to make the changes we should have been working toward already. Why do we wait for something devastating to occur in our life before we accept growth and pursue it? The adult that doesn't push herself or himself without the occurrence of calamity is the seventh grader who waits for their summer vacation to be taken away in order to finish their assignments and focus on the tasks before them. For some, 
tragedy sparks an awakening eye-opener that is necessary for them to begin a forward movement, bringing positive change into their life. For others, tragedy only further ingrains negative emotions they were previously operating in and excuses them from trying to better their perspective out of deep-seated pessimistic thoughts and outlooks on life. Past experiences that are emotionally fortified become the predictable experience of the future. People are unknowingly addicted to trauma and attract more traumatic events into their life because of the intimate relationship with those negative emotions and experiences. People are unknowingly addicted to trauma and attract more traumatic events into their life because of their intimate relationship with those negative emotions and experiences. If we think with our emotions, we will find ourselves making poor choices repeatedly. And this is a mental mistake that tragically ends the relationships that could have otherwise been prosperous and fulfilling. Change is necessary for survival. And if you want a marriage that survives all the challenges and tests that come at it, Learn to persistently build healthy mental habits and focus on positive and desired outcomes. You don't have to trade a traumatic event or tragedy for the changes your marriage needs. Joy, love, peace, and inspiration can be the state in which you make up your mind to change. Or you can wait for fear, loss, disease, and depression to get you moving on to the eighth grade. In the seventh grade, experiences of backstabbing and various social complexities run rampant. If you have had to endure an unfaithful spouse, know that there is a silver lining to this menacing dark cloud. Each marriage that experiences infidelity may vary somewhat in circumstances, but a common chord runs through the mind of the cheater They want an escape from a relationship they feel enslaved to being unhappy in. People cheat for many reasons. Although cheating is never an acceptable answer to fulfilling abandoned wants and needs, there can always be reconciliation between a couple that agrees that change is needed on behalf of both of them. Some of the strongest marriages have endured the most horrific of affairs. Unfortunately, The trauma unfaithfulness caused is many times the spark needed to search out the questions and answers to why the door to infidelity was ever opened in the first place. Recovering from such a heart-wrenching and treacherous act takes a lot of work. Open communication and a mutual desire for transparency and prolific change. Don't ever feel too embarrassed or ashamed to seek help from a mentor couple. The worst thing you can do is try to bury what you are going through and hope it will never resurface. Everything done in the dark is eventually brought to the light. Confront your issues so you don't have to be haunted by them in your future. Be honest with yourself and your spouse so you can both openly confront the weaknesses of your relationship, knowing beforehand that the consequences of infidelity are tragic and devastating for everyone affected by it, financially, mentally, spiritually, and physically, can help deter someone from walking down a path that so often is a path of no return. In elementary and junior high, cheating, plagiarism is punishable by suspension, But in high school and college levels, cheating is usually punishable by expulsion. The higher the level of education, the higher the level of maturity is expected. So adultery in an immature marriage may be more likely to be forgiven after a suspension. Because both partners know they are far off base from having it all together. Whereas, in contrast, a cheating spouse of a more developed relationship is much less of a forgiving situation, often resulting in expulsion from school. By the end of seventh grade, students have realized their value as a human being with purpose on this earth. 
Seventh graders have been challenged by bullies and have learned how to respond in ways that do not add fuel to fire, but rather extinguish flames and encourage positive change. Seventh graders have learned the secrets to staying excited about their relationship with school and the fun in keeping the fire and desire for education going for years to come. This has been Chapter 9, Seventh Grade of the book Growing into a Mature Marriage from Kindergarten to College by Delise Collins, available on Amazon.com and DeliseCollins.com. Thank you for listening.